Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, more details emerge following the fatal crash of NHL player and Jersey native Johnny Gaudreau and his brother. Advocates are demanding safer streets. The system that we have now is definitely not working and we need to end the carnage on our roadways. Plus, three years later, Tropical Storm Ida's devastation is still gripping some homeowners in New Jersey. A bill on the governor's desk could deliver critical aid. It feels like we're still in the hurricane. We're still struggling. We're still fighting for what, what's right. Also, a New Jersey court rules smoking can continue inside Atlantic City casinos, a major blow to casino workers. And banning cell phones as kids head back to school, several districts are implementing new rules in the classroom. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. We begin with a few key stories we're following. First, Rutgers University is in the hot seat. President Jonathan Holloway is calling for an external investigation into the state school's women's gymnastics program, following allegations that the team's coach fostered a toxic culture of bullying and favoritism, and that pleas for help by athletes were ignored by athletic director Pat Hobbs. Hobbs abruptly resigned on August 16th, citing vague health issues. Meanwhile, Governor Murphy on Friday publicly confirmed before Hobbs' departure that Rutgers was conducting an internal investigation over a possible inappropriate consensual relationship he was having. Now, Murphy called the allegations from current and former Rutgers gymnasts, quote, really ugly and very disturbing. Some team members filed formal complaints but told NJ.com they believe Hobbs shut the them down at least partially because he had a relationship with the coach. In a statement, Rutgers says it takes very seriously and investigates all complaints alleging violations of university policy. Hobbs was slated to stay in his position, in which he earned more than a million dollars a year until 2028. And Governor Murphy late today signed legislation expanding New Jersey's Sexual Assault Victims Bill of Rights, requiring that victims are notified of certain developments when it comes to evidence in their cases, including whether police obtained the DNA profile of an assailant during processing, whether that DNA has been entered into a database, and if it matches the DNA of other profiles in other databases. The new law also expands reporting on so-called rape kits by letting victims know if evidence was submitted to a forensic lab. Also tonight, we're entering the final weeks of what's been a historically hot and humid summer, but a proposal to protect New Jersey workers who have to deal with extreme heat on the job remains stalled in Trenton. Labor advocates are urging state lawmakers to take up a bill that would create new protections for workers on hot days, with requirements including more frequent breaks and access to water, along with increased staffing to spread the workload. Hundreds of workers across the country have died from heat exposure over the last decades. That's according to federal statistics. And the issue is becoming more pressing as climate change drives temperatures and humidity higher. Business lobbyists have fiercely opposed the bill calling it an expensive and inflexible proposal. The bill comes as the Biden administration pushes to create new workplace heat protections on the federal level. And there are more details tonight surrounding the tragic death of NHL hockey star Johnny Gaudreau and his brother Matthew. The accused drunk driver who hit and killed the brothers near their family home in Salem County last Thursday is a high-ranking military officer in the state. According to NJ.com, the driver, Sean Higgins, is a major in the New Jersey Army National Guard and works at a nonprofit for substance abuse treatment headquartered in Pennsylvania. 
Police documents show Higgins admitted to police he drank five or six beers before the crash. The Goudreaux's wives and sister posted tributes this weekend on their social media accounts, speaking publicly for the first time since the fatal accident, vowing to honor their lives. Now, it's been a dangerous year on New Jersey's roads. According to state police statistics, there have been 407 fatal crashes and 429 fatalities so far. That's a roughly 13 percent increase increase from last year, with still several months remaining on the calendar. Sangeeta Badlani knows all too well the grief and pain the Goudreau family is experiencing. Her 11-year-old son was killed by a driver in 2011 after they ran a stop sign. She's dedicated her life's work to preventing similar tragedies by creating the Nikhil Badlani Foundation and Families for Safe Streets. She joins me now. Sangeeta, I'm glad to get your insight for a, a topic like this. When you read about another family losing their children in a preventable tragedy, what goes through your mind? Uh, so, you know, every time I read another traffic uh, death, it's like the heartbreaking loss of the Gudru brothers. I relive the tragedy of losing my beloved son Nikhil in a car crash. Uh, when a driver ran through a stop sign. And uh, behind every statistic, there's a story of unimaginable grief and a loved one that was taken too soon. As you may know that each year, around 600 people die on New Jersey roadways. Now, these deaths are all preventable, as you said. These are preventable crashes. We need to change the system and the system that we have now is definitely not working. And we need to end the carnage on our roadways. Through, and your, through your foundation, Sangeeta, and through the Vision Zero Alliance, what have you identified that's missing? Because there have been a number of new laws put on the books. You, in fact, um, have helped to usher some of those reforms through. But then what largely are we missing? to be able to save another life. Right, so there's a ton that we can do. You know, there's a lot of things that one can do. So first of all, we need to thoroughly investigate each traffic death and we need to create safer infrastructure, especially biking and walking, and then fill the gaps for the biking and walking networks for everyone to ensure that everyone, no matter how they travel, they can do so safely. Are, are bike and lanes and, and pedestrian lanes, Sang Sangeeta, uh, enough? I mean, because inevitably people get behind the wheel uh, intoxicated. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're not enough. And that's that's why I say we need to take a holistic approach. So, you know, I talk about biking and walking infrastructure because you see that in urban areas, but not so many in so much in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. And that's why I bring that up. But I also think we need to equip our police with proven technologies, you know, that will enforce for speeding laws. We need our state agencies to prioritize safety, which has not been happening. And the state needs to follow the national roadway safety strategy that at the heart of it is the safe system approach, which talks about safer roads. What does that mean? You design the roads in a way that will mitigate human mistakes. It recognizes that humans will make errors, but our road system should not. We should be focusing on safer vehicles. That means, you know, we need to promote designs and technologies in these vehicles that will help us to prevent these tragedies. We need to set speed limits, you know, based on the road design and the conditions. And we need to have safer road users mm -hmm. to encourage safe and responsible driving behaviors. And then the post-crash care, which is to improve emergency response. And then also the medical care that we can provide to people with these injuries. Sure. And that's why we as Vision Zero New Jersey Alliance are urging our state leaders to pass the Target Zero Commission Bill. And this bill aims to study, examine, and review all aspects of traffic safety with focus, specific focus on equity, access, and mobility for all road users. That will end 
traffic fatalities by 2040. Sangeeta Badlani, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Three years ago, Tropical Storm Ida tore through New Jersey, causing severe inland flooding and destroying homes. Many of the homeowners who were hard hit are still feeling the burdens of the storm, unable to move forward with fixing their properties and living in disarray. A bill sitting on Governor Murphy's desk would offer some financial help, but as senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, he's yet to sign it. While the hurricane has passed, and it's been three years, it feels like we're still in the hurricane. We're still struggling. We're still fighting for what, what's right. Three years after Ida, Debbie Josephs has partly repaired and refurnished her Manville home. The last time we spoke in her bare living room, only a year had passed since Ida's floodwaters had inundated the Lost Valley section of town, forcing her to flee in a police rescue boat. That trauma lingers, but a botched recovery has only made it worse, she says. People are giving up. What do you mean? They're just walking away. Some people are just walking away because they're tired. They're tired of fighting. Joseph's borrowed 25000 from the federal government and took out more personal loans just to make her home livable. But FEMA's classified the house as substantially damaged. So to sell it, she needs to elevate it above potential floodwaters. But without a federal grant, she can't do that out of pocket. She's stuck. You can't sell your home can't sell it. Okay. Cannot sell it until you elevate it or the buyer agrees to elevate it. Now, who's going to buy a house and then have to put another 100000 in it? They're at this point where they feel people don't hear them and they're invisible. Jody Stewart's an advocate who's pushed for more government aid for Ida's survivors. She says Ida's still taking a human toll. I'm watching families break up right now because of the lack of recovery. It's not right, it's not fair, and I'll blame the government every time about it. Last September, DEP officials decided not to spend any more federal aid dollars on fixing or elevating homes in Manville because it figured that Lost Valley would continue to flood. Instead, it offered 78 residents here Blue Acres buyouts. They're not paying for you to lift it anymore, so you have to pay, for, pay to lift it and also it's not really worth it because your house is still in the valley. It's going to get flooded no matter what. Lucas Rich says his family will probably take a Blue Acres buyout for their home. It's a hard choice. Some Lost Valley homes stand frozen in time, partially raised. But New Jersey's legislature unanimously passed a bill that would offer qualifying Ida victims a break on mortgages and foreclosures. It allows some of these property owners that are still waiting for answers some time without interest fees or penalties to kind of get their feet under them uh, and hopefully some answers to questions they've been asking for three years. Now. Republican Senator Doug Steinhardt backed the bill that would provide a year of mortgage and foreclosure forbearance for folks who got federal disaster relief for damages Ida did to their homes, who qualify with a household income that's less than 150 percent of median earnings for their zip code and who don't have significant savings on hand. The governor still hasn't signed it. So Steinhardt says he just sent Murphy a letter urging for these families, you hold the keys to their homes and families literally. Please let them in. It's extremely frustrating and I tried to express uh, my frustration as politely as possible. Democrat Troy Singleton, a Maine Senate co-sponsor, said in a statement, every day, week, month and year of inaction is more time these families suffer financially and emotionally. Our members are disappointed in our governor. They really feel he doesn't care. Where has he been? It's a 12 month forbearance. That will mean absolutely nothing to the higher ups. But to us in Manville, it would mean the world. The governor's office hasn't responded to our request for comment. Unless Murphy vetoes it, the bill becomes law September 12th. Joseph says that might help her sleep at night. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. 
In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, smoking will continue inside Atlantic City's casinos. A Superior Court judge on Friday dealt a major blow to a group of casino workers who've been trying to get smoking banned from casino floors. The judge dismissed their lawsuit and kept in place a loophole that exempts casinos from following the statewide ban on indoor smoking. As Ted Goldberg reports, the Union for Workers argued they had a constitutional right to breathe clean air, but the judge didn't see it that way. It was like a gut punch. How about a kick in the groin? Casino dealers hoping to avoid tobacco smoke were dealt a losing hand last week when a judge dismissed their lawsuit that tried to ban indoor smoking in Atlantic City. I had actually allowed myself to believe that, uh, that justice was going to be done this time. We waited three months just to hear we were dismissed and that everything else the other side wanted was granted. New Jersey's Smoke-Free Air Act bans indoor smoking in almost all workplaces and public spaces. Casinos are a notable exception, and workers argued that the carve-out violated the state constitution. A judge disagreed and threw out a lawsuit filed by a union representing some casino employees, saying while the court is sympathetic to the health hazards, it has determined that safety is not a fundamental right. I find that so outrageous. When the casino said it in court, I was shocked. The judge argued while workers have the right to pursue and obtain safety in the workplace, that safety is not guaranteed, particularly when a person freely chooses to work in a dangerous profession. Nancy Erica Smith, lead counsel for the union, plans to appeal this ruling to the state Supreme Court. That's really not how we live anymore, that you just say quit your job if the job is made unsafe by greedy corporations. Hey, coal miners, they don't have to work in coal mines. Why are we going to make them safe? We could say women who don't like being sexually harassed, stay home. The dismissal was praised by the Casino Association of New Jersey. President Mark Jan Antonio said in a statement, we are gratified by the court's decision to dismiss. The casino industry and other stakeholders, including the city of Atlantic City and Unite Here Local 54, have taken significant steps over the years to create a healthier environment for employees and patrons, including limiting smoking to just a fraction of the floor space. Workers are now looking to go the legislative route even though bills to ban smoking in casinos have stalled in Trenton. They have the opportunity to do the right thing right now. As soon as they get back in session, let's move the bill. Let's make it right for these workers. We're going to be calling people out publicly. We're going to be doing PR campaigns. We're going to have rallies. Um, we're, 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 you know, again, we're fighting for our lives. We're like a cornered animal right now. We're fighting for our lives. So whatever we have to do, we will do. We need somebody courageous enough to say, this is wrong, it's time to stop it. And there are people that have an opportunity that have influence and power in this state that are not stepping up. A bill to eliminate the carve out for casinos did pass the Senate Health Committee in January, but we haven't heard much about it since. The court adopted the casino argument that Atlantic City is different. <laughs> um, other than their in intense political contributions, I can't imagine why Atlantic City is different. We're going to keep on taking any opportunity we have to keep fighting for this. We're not going to stop. We are fighting for our lives, literally. Some of our opposition are, are waiting for this to end and us to go away quietly, and it's not going to happen. We have to do this every night, eight hours a day. It's not. We're not going away, and we will win this fight. There's no doubt about it. Casino workers say if the bill continues to stall, more people will be at risk of inhaling secondhand smoke. As we're waiting and as we are, everybody wants to see what happens, I get to see what really happens. And it's another ki cancer diagnosis from my girlfriend just recently. It's time to recognize that these workers deserve the same as everybody else. The casinos have argued that eliminating smoking would lead to a loss of jobs and revenue. Some say less smoke would invite more gamblers. But it's a safe bet that this argument isn't going away quietly anytime soon. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. Support for the Business Report is provided by Riverview Jazz, presenting the first annual Jersey City Latin Jazz Festival on Saturday, September 14th at Exchange Place Plaza in Jersey City. Performance schedule and further details for this open to all event can be found online at riverviewjazz.org.
Well, some public school students are starting the new school year with a new rule, no cell phones. It's a growing movement in districts across the state as more evidence points to the negative effects of excessive cell phone use on youth, including increased anxiety and depression. As senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports, the policy is being rolled out smoothly in some areas while hitting a few hurdles in others. It was really challenging to compete with students and their cell phones during instructional time. So Middletown students returning to school today were met with a new district policy for cell phone use. And a way for the day policy, which encumbers really any type of electronic communication device. Students in Cherry Hill, also starting school today, saw a similar policy change. During instructional time, uh, students are prohibited from uh, displaying or utilizing a wireless communication device. That would be cellular phone, uh, iPad, uh, AirPod, earphones. Both district superintendents feel their policies strike a middle of the road balance between locking phones away or letting them stay on the student's person. Cherry Hill Superintendent Kwame Morton Sr. says his policy came after polling teachers and parents and having lengthy meetings with students. Students agreed that the devices uh, presented a negative uh, aspect to their to, to their day. Um, but they didn't want us to completely and totally ban the devices all outright, outright from school. So the request was to try to find a happy medium, and that was allow students to maintain their devices uh, in their bags or on their person but to just ban them during instructional time. In addition to preserving quality instructional time, Superintendent Jessica Alphone says they're hoping to see a positive impact on students' social and emotional health. Students more than ever before um, have been experiencing um, mental health challenges, whether it be anxiety, school avoidance, um, and all those things really have come on the heels of the pandemic. And certainly the cell phone use and students having devices in their hands has definitely ramped up um, since that time where many, many places, including education, really went to a totally virtual environment. Those mental health challenges are clear in the work that Ashley Marola does as a licensed professional counselor who works with young people. We definitely see a huge increase in anxiety and depression. We even see um, almost 50% of youth from 13 to 17 years old reporting cyberbullying going on online. And these youth also know that being online is contributing to these feelings of anxiety and depression. She sees the phone ban in schools as a positive. All we can hope for is that more children actually get the opportunity to put their phones away, you know, shut it off for a bit, even turning off the notifications, right, will give them that relief. But many districts in the state, including Montclair, are still considering how to move forward with phone policies. The state's left it up to districts to decide. Parents in Montclair sent a letter to their acting superintendent asking for a more drastic step that would use a program called Yonder that locks phones away in a pouch. My goal is to make sure that my child and his peers do not have cell phones in the classroom, distracting them while they are paying attention to instruction, while they're in the lunchroom socializing and making friendships that will help them get through their day and through their next n number of years of school. And as more districts put policies in place, questions around enforcement will have to be considered as well. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. That does it for us tonight, but before you go, our NJ Decides 2024 Election Exchange podcast drops today. It's where David Cruz, Colleen O'Day, and I go one-on-one -on -one with the candidates running for Congress this November. All 12 U.S. House seats are up for grabs and one Senate seat is on the line, so this is a chance for you to meet the candidates and hear why they think they deserve your vote. Here's a sneak peek. Well, this November, your vote is critical, and it could decide the balance of power in Congress. All 12 congressional seats are up for grabs here in New Jersey, so we're talking to the candidates and drilling down on the issues to help you decide where to cast your vote. This race completely oh, changed the no fact doubt. that there's no county line ballot. Um, the fact that you knocked out the first lady from running in a primary against you, that's big stuff. Well, look, uh, I'm proud of the fact that New Jersey politics will never be the same. There's nothing better than, as I said, connecting with your constituents. And right now I feel that we need better representation. 
in District 5. You also talked about wars. I mean, you're not yeah. saying that the wars that are in Ukraine and yeah. um, Israel, Palestine, that we had anything to do with that, that the Biden-Harris yeah. administration had anything Well, I mean, to do with listen, that? you had a lot of things going on with the pipeline where we had a President Joe Biden say that, uh, you know, we should blow up the pipeline. The guy I'm running against, Frank Pallone, has been in office since 1988 and in this district since 1993. So I'm guessing you would support term limits. Absolutely. How are things with you uh, and him and him with you? You know, he's my father, you know, and um, it's obviously been a challenging couple of months. Um, but, you know, as I've talked about before with you, and especially during the primary, my focus was always focusing on what's within my control. And I know Chris Smith likes to say, like, oh, we want uh, abortion on demand all up to the ninth month. Um, a dead fetus in a woman at eight months is called an abortion. Mm. And it, we just, we cannot be treating other human beings this way. Went on to win the primary by almost eight, nine points. So uh, I did not have any political backing with me. Uh, I did it on my own, and that's what I intend to do in the general election as well. You can check it out by downloading the NJ Decides Election Exchange podcast wherever you listen. Episodes for each voting district start dropping today. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire team at NJ Spotlight News, thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, and by the PSCG Foundation. NJM Insurance Group has been serving New Jersey businesses for over a century. As part of the Garden State, we help companies keep their vehicles on the road, employees on the job, and projects on track. Working to protect employees from illness and injury, to keep goods and services moving across the state. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.